These are the last pictures ever taken of 27-year-old mother of two, Sergit Atwell. With her is her mother-in-law, Bakken Atwell, who persuaded her to go to India to attend this family wedding. Days later, she went missing and was never seen again. Dad predicted quite firmly and quite worryingly that Sergit would be killed. She was a thorn in the side all the time. Sergit was murdered on the orders of her own husband and mother-in-law, but they cleverly covered their tracks. I remember the mother-in-law saying to me, if she's going to have divorce, then it'll be over my dead body. These killers were so cold and heartless, they were prepared to murder and make their own grandchildren suffer the loss of their mother. To think that she was dead was just... And then to think that my dad and grandma had killed her. I think they wanted to just kill me inside. Near enough, they did. I'm Laura Richards, a criminal psychologist specialising in murder prevention. I want to find out why the family Sergit married into would so coldly conspire to kill her. Were there any warning signs and could anything have been done to stop them? Sergit was just 16 years old when her parents organised for her to have an arranged marriage. The year was 1988. Sergit's brother Jagdish remembers it clearly. I think I was about 14, 15 when I went along with Dad to go and see the family. They were a plain, pretty standard family uh, and they looked okay-ish, they looked fine, nothing to fault them. And uh, it, it was Dad's friend at the time who was the intermediary and he made a positive recommendation about them. The husband chosen for Sergit was Sukh Dev Atwell, a man she barely knew. While she was prepared to go along with the arranged marriage, her brother knew she wasn't happy. On the day of the marriage, I remember vividly, and I felt very sorry about this. Uh, uh, she actually cried that morning out of anxiety, mm. out of fear, out of regret, out of a lot of things that were no doubt going on in her mind. And I remember my mum's sister uh, trying to reassure her. Um, but the atmosphere was that marriage is the thing to do, it's a, it's, a, it's a mark of tradition, it's a mark of family order and honour and process. And I remember on the day, in fact, I spoke to her briefly as, just after the marriage ceremony. She was very dull and very numb and very quiet. was quite flat about the whole Yeah, process. very flat about the whole thing. Uh, I remember that vividly because she was lifeless. It proved to be a union Sergit's family would bitterly regret. She was just pretty much picked up and plonked with the Atwell family and uh, told, you're married, get on with it and get on with your life. At only 16, Sergit was forced to move to Hayes in Middlesex into a house with her husband and in-laws. This meant that she was a hundred miles away from her own family in Coventry. In the early years of the marriage, to the outside world, everything seemed to be working out well. After two years, the couple had a baby girl, Pavan. And the first five years seemed to be very calm, happy, a good relationship, people getting on with their lives, Sergit's happy, her husband's happy. Um, that was the initial impression we had a marriage without any incident, a marriage without any huff and puff and without any explosions. The only thing the family noticed was that Sergit's mother-in-law seemed to be very controlling. All the family was uh, orbiting around Bachan. So, she was the main boss, actually, in the family. And what did you think of her when you met her, first of all? Well, I got a mixed feeling about her that he was a quite clever lady at the start, I had the impression, but a bit too bossy, actually. So she really ruled the roost? She yeah, told yeah, everyone... Yeah. She was ruling the whole family, like... 
including Sergit's husband. Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody. What Sergit's father didn't realise was that this imposing head of the family would try to control his daughter's life at all costs. In early December 1998, Bakan and Sergit boarded a plane to India to attend two family weddings. But this was no normal family vacation. While Sergit did attend the weddings, what happened next was both shocking and brutal. Sergit was drugged, strangled, and thrown into the river Ravi in the Punjab. Her murder was planned and organized by her mother-in-law and her own husband. So what had happened in the years leading up to this terrible family murder? I want to find out what was really going on. For the early years of her marriage, I'm told that Sergit managed to pretend that everything was okay. But it wasn't. She was struggling to fit in with the Atwells, who were more traditional than her own family. As the newest daughter-in-law, she was very low in the pecking order. She was made to go out to work, but her earnings were controlled by her mother-in-law. After five years of marriage, she'd reached breaking point, ran away, and confided in her brother, who was just 19. I went to see her, and we sat down, we, we thrashed out what was happening in, in, her pro, in her marriage. And she pulled through many points and many issues, ranging from the sisters-in-law all ganging up against her, frequently giving her a good talking to and telling off that you're, you're not conforming to the expected standards of behaviour that we expect in the Atwell family. That combined with the fact that um, she had a mother-in-law who was constantly dominating her, repeating exactly the same messages of what she expected of her, mm. how she should live, how she should function as a, an, an orderly wife, um, all those domineering, critical, negative messages, all which together snowballed into her feeling that she was being controlled and confined by this family. Sergit was persuaded to return home despite all the abuse. I have also learned that she was physically assaulted by her violent husband. Through my work, I know that abuse can escalate and end in murder. He would resort to violence. On her. On her. Yeah for the simple reason that he found her difficult. I was naturally distressed to see my sister in such a state. I was shocked, first of all, by the fact that there was such a long period of emotional hurt and, and, and emotional pain that she was carrying around, all concealed, beneath a, a, a veneer of happiness and normality. I'm beginning to get a clear picture of Sergit being seriously abused and policed at home by her strict Sikh mother-in-law and husband. The one person who can tell me what it was like to be in the Atwell family is Sergit's daughter Pavan, who was just a young child at the time. I mean, she just wanted to break free, break free really. That's all she wanted to do. And like, she had that. I, I remember seeing her upset, but I never remember my dad like shouting at her or screaming at her but it must have been done behind closed doors. Because I remember seeing her bruised. I remember seeing her bruised quite a lot, but I just never used to question it. You didn't really understand why. Yeah, because I was so small, I didn't really understand. But your father never behaved like that towards you? No. Was he ever abusive or aggressive he to was, you? He or? was aggressive. He's just got a very aggressive nature, and I think that's just in his nature. So he's quite an aggressive and violent person, but he never, he never, he wasn't physically violent. But few people were aware that Suk Dave Atwal was abusive due to the carefully crafted image he portrayed outside of the home. From talking to people who knew him, he seemed like a kind and friendly man. They were led to believe that Sergit was the one not to be trusted. 
I've just come from speaking to some of the neighbours and found out some really interesting things. Sergit's husband, Soup Dave, had been telling them all that she was a very bad mother and a bad woman. And when Sergit was very unhappy, she did try and make an approach of her own, but nobody wanted to know and nobody wanted to help because they were all on his side. Sergit was a woman who was incredibly isolated. She was controlled in the house she shared with her extended family and desperately wanted to leave. But by 1998, she had given birth to a young son and she was worried she might lose her children, so she kept trying to make things work. But she couldn't. In 1998, shortly before she disappeared, Sergit consulted a solicitor about a divorce. She had begun a relationship with another man. And through the sheer, the battering and the and the, the psychological violence and the physical violence and the torturous experience, she decided enough was enough. I'm not going to be this quiet, submissive daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever it takes, I'm going to speak up. And finally she decided out. I want out of this family. Sergit's decision didn't go down well with her husband's family. They stood to lose out financially from a divorce as Sergit partoned the shared house. They also felt it would bring shame on the family. I remember the mother-in-law saying to me, what is, this, what is this rubbish that your sister is talking about, uh, about divorce? If she's going to have divorce, then she, it'll be over my dead body. To me, that was just this old, grumpy lady uh, firing off randomly her emotional mm. anger. I thought nothing of it. As it transpired, this was not an idle threat. She would go to even greater lengths to make sure that divorce never happened. I'm Laura Richards, a criminal psychologist, profiling the murder of 27-year-old Sergeant Atwell. It took the police almost 10 years and three investigations to gather enough evidence to prove the young mother was murdered on the order of her mother-in-law and the husband. Her body was never found. So just what did the police discover across all these years of their investigation? Well, I'm on my way to meet the officer in charge of the investigation to find out. The police learned that their main suspects Suk Dave and his mother Bakan came with their family to the UK in the 1970s. It seemed they were respected in the Sikh community and known for being traditionalists. Detective Chief Inspector Clive Driscoll led the murder inquiry. She was certainly a very religious woman. She used to attend the local Gudua regularly. She used to do quite a lot of cooking down there and I, and I think there's many people within that community would, would find it extremely hard to believe that she could then carry out quite a cold and cynical crime. After Sergit failed to return from a trip to India, these seemingly caring and religious in-laws tried to divert the police's attention away from themselves. Certainly, at every turn, Mr. Athwell, Sukhdev Athwell, did everything in his power to hinder and frustrate not only the investigation in the United Kingdom, but also the investigation in India, whilst doing everything in his power to undermine the credibility and the dignity of his wife. He's a compulsive liar who maybe not, maybe he's long since forgotten what the truth is. When Backham returned to England without her daughter-in-law, Sergit's family became very worried. This was heightened by the fact that her husband, Suk Dave, and his mother didn't seem at all concerned. The 18th came, Sergit's uh, mother-in-law arrived back home. Um, there was some phone call between both sides of the family. And from that phone call, it became evident that Sergit hadn't returned home. And from there, the alarm bells started to ring very loudly. I remember the mother-in-law saying this, don't you know where Sergit is? And, and she was being rather flippant. Oh, but why should I know? She's your daughter. And uh, she left early anyway, so why, why would I know? And it was at that point when we had that very cold, chilling 
response from her that we started to seriously wonder, is Sergit actually dead? Has she been killed? Sergit's family alerted the police, who at first treated Sergit as a missing person. This would later become a murder inquiry. Fast forward nine years, and what did the police eventually learn about the build-up to this murder? Sergit's mother-in-law, Bakan Atwal, was instrumental in it all, having become the self-appointed head of the family following the death of her husband in 1990. She decided Sergit was bringing shame on the family, so she hatched a plan to kill her. Behind me is the house where the Atwells called a family meeting to decide the fate of young Sergit Atwell. I intend to find out exactly why they decided to get rid of this beautiful, young, vibrant mother. Basically, what all of our witnesses said um, about the meeting was that, um, that Mrs. Backencore called the meeting, and at the meeting she said that she'd arranged with a family member who lived in India, she'd arranged for Sergit to be taken care of. Bakken made it clear to her family that Sergit's affair was shaming them and their reputation would be damaged further if she got a divorce. Everybody at that meeting basically knew exactly that that meant that Sergit would be killed. No one came forward to warn the authorities at the time. Nor did they warn Sergit. Some were no doubt too frightened of the potential consequences to their own safety. I have no doubt that had action been taken, Sergit's murder might have been prevented. Sergit knew she was in trouble with her in-laws for wanting a divorce. They claimed she was damaging their honour and honour was something they valued very highly, more than anything else. So why, when she was trying to separate, did she agree to go to India with the mother-in-law she despised? It just doesn't make sense. Well, some people speculate, and there may be some truth in this, um, because circumstances of what happened in, in Punjab seem to match up with this. She may have been coerced or pushed into going along with the condition that We've got to attend two family weddings on the Atwell side. They think this marriage is fine and good. I need to show them that you are still with us and you're part of our family. If you agree to come along, show yourself there as a happy character and, and maintain our family face there and family honour. then I, the mother-in-law, will give you your divorce without further fuss and further quarrel. So if you do this last one thing for us. Sergit had no doubt been tricked. She was in fact lured out to a place where it would be much easier to murder her and for her killers to get away with it. On average, at least 12 women in the UK are known each year to have been killed by family members because of so-called honour. Jagdish approached the women's group, the Southall Black Sisters, for help in making sure Sergit's disappearance was fully investigated. In the routine cases, women are often persuaded to go abroad, either for a holiday or to see relatives or uh, to go to a wedding, um, which is what Sajid did. And when they go there, then they're subject to abuse, to imprisonment, to violence, to forced marriage, and in the more extreme cases, to murder. And our advice to women, I've often been, is that if there is a context of domestic violence or abuse within the family before they go, is do not go abroad, do not travel. doesn't matter what the excuse is. It uh, doesn't matter even if your relations within the family have improved from the last incident. And, and, and usually they do improve because the family want to build up that trust and persuade them to go back and kind of get rid of any suspicions that they might have. Um, and therefore, you know, it is wiser not to go in that kind of context. Being taken abroad was clearly a real risk for Sergit. 
She had suffered domestic violence and there had been talk of her tainting and dishonouring the Atwell family. It was very clear that once she got to India that she would be killed. And this isn't uncommon in these types of cases. Women being lured under a, a ruse or a con to get on a plane and go abroad and then them just disappearing and the family saying that they've just gone away of their own volition. It's their own accord. They've taken themselves off. And that's exactly what happened to Surgit. During their investigation, the police found video evidence proving that Surgit did actually attend the family weddings in India. She can be seen here with her mother-in-law, Bakan, just days before her murder. She doesn't look particularly anxious. And at times is seen having a laugh and a joke. Surgit's own family did think it was strange that she went to India with the mother-in-law she loathed. But only Surgit's father really sensed the full danger. I got the feeling that they are they are going to get rid of Sarjeet, actually. Why did you think that? Well, because I think that it's very serious. They like to get rid of her, get rid of her off, you know, out of the family. She was a thorn in the side all the time. He, he actually predicted quite, quite firmly and quite worryingly that Sarjeet would be killed. Now, we, we reacted to his comments by saying, Dad, you're just... You're just sort of going over the top there. Being dramatic. Yeah. You know, that, those were my exact feelings at the time. And uh, I just thought, that, yeah, things are very bad in a marriage, but not that bad that they're going, they would actually go and kill her. So we, we sort of wrongly, it now appears, wrongly we dismissed his comments. Had we, had we seized on those comments and done something about it there and then, perhaps... Um, Perhaps we could have saved Sergeant now. We could have alerted the authorities here and in India. But the authorities weren't alerted. And this woman, back in Atwell, was seen dancing and laughing just days before she had her daughter-in-law murdered. As a criminal psychologist specialising in homicide prevention, I'm determined that lessons should be learnt from so-called honour killings, and in particular, the case of Sergeant Atwell. If we understand her killers better and build a profile of what happened, we can help prevent future murders. The killers in this case, Bakan and Sukh Dave Atwell, attempted to cover up Sergeant's death. But her family were highly suspicious and worried when she failed to return from India. By this time, her brother Jagdish suspected foul play. Anxiously, we went down to the, the Atwell house to find out and ask some questions. Face to face. Face to face. And we were, we, were, we, were, we were received with a whole combination of contradictory and evasive responses. Don't worry, Sajit's um, run away with a boyfriend. That was one response we had. Uh, Sajit's run away with a boyfriend. She'll be back in three weeks. So let's not panic, let's not run around, let's not get crazy, let's not call the police. I told to my son-in-law first that you should approach to the police. He says, what for? I says, well, your, miss your wife is missing, so you should go to the police. And if you don't go to the police, I will go to the police. And I will put your name under blame. He says, oh, no, no, don't do that. I says, why not? Because I left my daughter safe and sound with you. And now you are responsible where she is. You tell me her whereabouts. Otherwise, I will tell to the police that you have done something wrong. But Sergit's side of the family were too concerned to wait. Having had no contact from her, they alerted the police and a missing person inquiry was launched. But it was an inquiry her husband and mother-in-law did their best to hinder. The police had to um, really be content with certainly the family feeding in information which wasn't true um, and continuously you know, suggesting she was somewhere else. We tried so hard to show that we wanted to be um, fair and open-minded to, to a new culture 
that we might have just forgot what we're actually here for, which is we are the police. What concerns me about this case is that we are already seeing how this murder could potentially have been missed altogether. And there's no doubt many others are. If it weren't for Sergit's relatives pushing, this may have remained another missing person statistic. But in this case, Sergit's father, Mahindapal, actually travelled out to the Punjab to gather information for himself and to get the Indian police to treat the case as a potential murder. My attention was actually to see different places and peoples. Possibly they can help me actually in finding Sarjeet. I was wanted actually that the police, Indian police should work hard on it and find out. No doubt actually they can find out actually what happened to my daughter and where she gone actually and where she, she has been thrown. No doubt about that. But hardly anybody acted anything for, on my behalf. What Mahindapal didn't realise was that the orchestrators of the murder had intervened to undermine the investigation. Sukhdev Atwal had written to the Indian authorities on forged Metropolitan Police paper to undermine Mahindapal's attempts and to discredit his character. What you can see here is, is basically that is a, a Metropolitan Police letter. That signature is, is undoubtedly of a, a police officer, serving police officer. That is our logo, that is our letter. What the family did, and we believe it was Sukhdev that did this, is that they took out what was the letter, what uh, the, the police officer wrote, and then by a fairly basic method, they typed this letter to stick it to our letter, then photocopied that letter. So this, if you were an Indian police officer, you would think this came from the Metropolitan Police Service. You would think this came from the then SIO of the Metropolitan Police Service investigating this murder. Unfortunately, this only came to light years later when the missing person investigation had become a full-scale murder inquiry. As well as this, Bakan and Sukhdev persuaded their local MP to write to the authorities in India in their support and sent faxes from a solicitor's office claiming Surgit had returned to England. What's particularly concerning to me in profiling these killers is not only the fact that they are callous murderers, but also their complete lack of concern for the children whose mother they had brutally taken. I don't really remember much from when I was little. Um, I just remember, like, my grandma coming back. And, I, and then I, when she came back, I asked where my mum was. And my dad said that she'll be back later, she's going to come back later. And I think this went on for a couple of months, that she'll be back later, she'll be back later. And then afterwards, when I asked him, where is she now? Um, he said that she'd run off with another man and she didn't love us anymore. That's why she'd gone. Did you understand I mean, that, what, what was being said? Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was shattered. I was completely shattered. I just thought, well, there must be something wrong with me. You thought you had done something yeah, wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think I blamed myself a lot for it. That's very sad to hear. So all the time she was away, you just thought it was something that you had done or yeah. that your mother had rejected you and, and didn't want to spend time with you. Mm. These children were subjected to a, to, a, to, to a process of brainwashing and indoctrination that um, your mum didn't care for you, she's run off with a boyfriend somewhere in the distance, unknown. She's still alive out there. Her photos from the house were removed. All her clothes from her wardrobes were removed. All signs and images about her were totally removed from the house. The children were not allowed to keep a photo, a memory, a memento, um, something about her. They were not allowed. Everything about her was actually removed. So much so, relatives were told that if you come to our house, you mustn't mention the name Sergit ever. So I've heard that the killers were both calculating and cold-blooded. Not only did they abuse Sergit, they continued to damage her children with their lies. By the year 2000, the police had gathered enough evidence to strongly suspect that Bakan and Sukh Dave were behind Sergit's disappearance and took them in for questioning. I remember it like so clearly because I was just getting ready for school and all of a sudden we had like police charging into the house. 
Open up, it's the police. Open up, please. My dad walked in the room and said, I'm going out with my friends. I'm going out with friends. I didn't know that they were police officers because they weren't wearing uniform. And then I saw them put handcuffs on my dad. So I thought, OK, they're not his friends. And I knew that that's what police do. And then they handcuffed my grandma too. So I thought, OK, they've done something wrong. Suk Dave and Bakken were soon released due to a lack of evidence. They were the main suspects, but the police didn't have enough to bring charges. There was no trace of Serge at anywhere, and her body hadn't been found. Moreover, the murder team was experiencing problems getting information from the Indian police, and the British Foreign Office had failed to lobby the Indian government effectively. So it was left to Serge's family to keep pushing for more action. Punjab police had their information, the British police had theirs, and the two were not exchanging that information. So that was a major flaw in the whole investigation process. Years go by, we continue to lobby, campaign, pose demanding questions of the Foreign Office. What is the Foreign Minister doing? Is he pursuing Sajit's case? She's a British national. Has he raised a case with the Indian authorities, the Indian government, like he has with other cases like Lucy Blackman in Japan, Ian Stillman in India, uh, Peter Bleach in India? Has he raised Sajit's case at the same time or on a similar level? And the answers we were getting back were no. I think there was a sense of outrage with the, and a sense of discrimination in the Sajid Atwal case. Because what we were saying is that, well, if it was a hostage situation, or there are other prisoners um, or people who, who've been killed, particularly white women abroad, and yet you've had public statements from the Home Secretary, from the government, about how awful this was and how they want the authorities abroad to investigate the case. And you got far quicker responses in those cases than you ever got in Sajid's case. Over five years passed, and despite persistent campaigning from Sajid's family, her case had gone cold. There was no sign of justice or closure. But in late 2004, a new police investigation team was brought in. Fresh evidence was discovered, which would call into question the Atwell's version of events. Sergit's personal diary was found during the search of the family house. It gives an incredible insight into the life Sergit was living and the abuse she suffered, contradicting the Atwell's account that they were all happy. So some of the things that are written in Sergit's diary are really quite interesting and they really back up these warning signs, the facts of what was really going on within this marriage. So she starts off by saying, since being married to my husband, I just found it very impossible to compromise with him. Every time I would try talking to him, he would disagree and involve his mother in our marriage. At one time, I did nothing about the situation as I was so young and worried about my parents' reputation in the community. So you can see the element of honour in there, that she's worried about the, the shame that that might bring to her, her own family in the community. And we get a real insight into just how controlling Sergit's mother-in-law was. When I had my baby, his mother took my child away from me and would get the baby to call her mummy. My baby grew more attached to my mother-in-law. I was told I'm an incapable mother by my husband and his family. So it's clear again, just with, in terms of the abuse, just making her feel as if she's not, you know, she's worthless. There are also clear references to Soup Dave's violence. Sergit tells how her husband would stalk and abuse her. Once he even made a threat to kill. These are all high risk factors for homicide and must be taken very seriously by professionals and anyone who experiences them. All these factors compounded to make Sergit very vulnerable. She should never have gone to India. Unfortunately, she didn't realise the risks. This was a murder waiting to happen. I'm Laura Richards, a criminal psychologist, and I'm building up a profile of the killers of Sergit Atwal. 
Hearing what her husband and mother-in-law did, both before and after her death, helps us to understand more about their capacity to commit murder. For many years, Sergit's disappearance remained a real mystery, and the killers started to think they'd got away with it. The case had gone cold. But as time passed, Sergit's brother received information detailing what had really happened to his sister. We started to get a trickle of anonymous phone calls and letters started to, started to turn up, posted from India, and some of them posted from the UK. So we're getting a combination of anonymous letters. And in these letters written in Punjabi, they detail how Sergit was actually killed. They set out the date, 15th of December 98. They set out the location where, from where she was taken, Shahpur Khandi, where she was staying with her mother-in-law. They set out the, uh, the story around her being taken in a jeep, strangled, and then her body being disposed of in the River Ravi. This was useful information. The problem was, it was all anonymous. But the new murder investigation team realised its value and knew the only way they would crack this case was to get witnesses in the UK to break their silence. There's absolutely no doubt that the fear factor that they, you know, that there had been a daughter-in-law killed, you would be next. And certainly for a long time in this investigation, our witnesses were frightened to come forward. And, and I think that the police have to work very hard to show the witnesses that we'll, we'll not only support and protect them uh, up until the court case, that we will support and protect them for as long as it takes. Some of the witnesses were close family members who had been at the family meeting where Sergit's murder was decided. Others had heard Backham boasting about what she had done. They had to be given special police protection and at times were in fear for their own safety. Some of our witnesses put their marriage, their houses, their children's futures, they put their own standing in their communities, they put all of that on the line to give evidence in the criminal justice system. Individuals who, at the time of Sergi's death, who were too frightened, too entrapped, have come forth and acted as, as key witnesses for the pro prosecution, spilling the beans on the family. It's clear to me that not only were the witnesses worried about the consequences for themselves of speaking out, they were also concerned about the impact it might have on the Sikh community. In my experience, it's not uncommon in honour-related cases for communities to collude with killers, in some cases to even encourage support and protect them. Surgit will have been viewed by some as the property of the Atwell family, giving them the right to take her life. I spoke to people in the community who thought it wasn't a police matter. They felt that this was a family matter. It should have been dealt with as a family and the police shouldn't have been involved in any way, shape or form. So, so I think there is a um, challenge for us all there to, uh, to accept that maybe in some communities that they see this not necessarily as a murder as I would and a terrible crime as I would, but they see it as a family matter where that should be dealt with in the family, and which I passionately disagree with, obviously. Getting frightened witnesses to give evidence in a court of law was no mean feat. It was that breakthrough, coupled with further incriminating evidence, that led to the successful convictions. The police team discovered that as the years passed, the killers became overconfident, thinking they would never be caught. Their greed took over when they faked Sergit's signature to get their hands on the shared family home. With Sergit out of the picture, what they did, they forged her signature on a series of legal documents to transfer Sergit's share of the ownership directly to the mother-in-law. And it was, it's now been clearly proven, as, as it was presented in the trial, that this was a forged signature, could have been nothing but a forged signature, the fact that this was done five, five years after Sergit's disappearance. Sergit suddenly hasn't popped in briefly to sign those documents and then popped out again. Somebody somewhere has done that. 
and they've done it very deliberately in a very organised and concealed way. With the discovery of Sergit's diary, the police could see that this financial greed was nothing new and was no doubt part of the killer's motive. They stood to lose out financially if Sergit got a divorce. Here's a telling extract from the diary written by Sergit. My mother-in-law borrowed £2,000 off me, which I never saw back. My wages were going into a joint account with my husband. He withdrew money from our account as he pleased and invested the money in his own account without my permission. He sold my jewellery and gave the money to his mother. You see from this just how controlling Sergit's husband and mother-in-law were, and greedy. Sikh Dave also rather suspiciously took out insurance policies on Sergit's life to the value of more than £160,000. It came into effect the very day she travelled out to India. Sikh Dave and Bakken clearly thought they got away with murder, but they hadn't. By 2005, the new police investigation team had built up enough evidence to charge them. After a 13-week trial, Bakan and Suk Dave Atwell were found guilty of murder at the Old Bailey and sentenced to life in prison. This was a groundbreaking case, the first ever of a murder abroad being tried and convicted under UK law. But two other victims were left behind, 15-year-old Pavan and her younger brother. They were left bewildered, with the Atwells still insisting there had been a mistake. The lies continued. At the end of the trial, when the verdict was announced that they were guilty and they would be charged, I don't know, I don't know what, I just felt so much frustration and anger, but then I was confused as well, because I was just thinking that they wouldn't be charged for nothing. And I was just thinking, like, how could, how could that even happen? because they were here, they were in England all this time. I just thought that they were in England all the time. How could they do that? Like, she's in India and she's with another man. So you thought she was still alive at this point? Yeah, I, 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 th I thought she was still alive. So think that she was dead was just... And then to think that my dad and grandma had killed her, it was, it was just... I don't know. I just had so many mixed emotions. Pavan wanted to know the truth and ran away. She turned to her aunt... She was another daughter-in-law who had come forward and given important evidence at the trial. Because she was the main witness for the case, I asked her questions and she, kind of, she told me the truth. And that's when it kind of hit me. But then I, I wasn't as shocked because I knew what they were like. I knew their character by now. So I just thought, OK, they're capable of doing it, but how could they lie? That was the main thing that got me so angry, like they lied. And what sorts of things did she say to you? Um, she told me that... They'd organised it. They said that we would take her to India and they, my grandma used the word get rid of, so we would get rid of her. And that's what they said. And they said to my auntie that if you say anything, we'll do the same thing to you. So she was, she was scared, she was frightened. And so before my mum was about to leave, she knew that they were taking her and she wouldn't come back, but she couldn't say anything to her. It was only now that the whole picture of what happened fell into place for Pavan, and it was a devastating story to come to terms with. That the mother she thought had abandoned her and she had grown to hate had in fact been murdered by the very people she trusted most. This case has destroyed many people's lives, um, and my heart goes out to the children. I personally hope to be able to support in whatever capacity I can, because I can't imagine what that must be like. Finally now, Sergit's side of the family have been reunited with the children after nine years of no contact. It's only now that they've broken out of the, 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 the closed circle of that paternal family that these children are now able to uh, begin to meet with us, speak with us, see pictures of their mother, talk about their inner feelings, a relationship with the side of the family that was described to them as devilish, as poisonous. Now the dust is being settled steadily.
Sergit's body was never found, so instead of a grave, a tree has been planted in her memory. Jagdish's campaign for justice hasn't ended either. He's now determined that the hitmen in India who carried out the murder should be brought to justice too. The UK courts have solidly and clearly uh, decided that a murder did take place in Punjab. And they found two people here guilty of orchestrating that murder from the UK. And yet, in spite of that highly credible and highly esteemed legal judgment from the UK, the Punjab police are still sitting on their laurels. They, they, what more do they need in terms of a, of a legally sound conviction to, to, to kick themselves into action? To start a proper investigation. To start a, a reinvestigation. And yet even now they are dithering and delaying and just keeping the whole case in oblivion. We can only hope that the Indian authorities will now bring those responsible for carrying out the contract killing to justice. Meanwhile, Bakan and Suk Dave are serving life sentences behind bars. They are proof that there is no honour in killing, only shame. It was the killer's concern about so-called honour, coupled with their opportunistic greed that led Bakan and Suk Dave to kill Sergit. It's important now that we learn from this case and others to prevent honour killings from happening in the future.